I'm glad to see everybody back for the second part of our climate symposium, which is our inaugural Thomas E. Lovejoy and Edward O. Wilson lecture, which has been named in honor of two distinguished scientists and NYBG friends who made very deep contributions uh, across really extraordinary careers to the field of conservation. I want to especially acknowledge uh, Tom Lovejoy's daughters, Annie, Betsy, and Kata, who have joined us today, and Tom's longtime associate, Carmen. Thank you for being with us today. In the second part of our symposium, we're going to focus on forests. As we heard from Dr. Hayhoe, there's a lot of solutions out there in the world, and some of those solutions rest with the world's forests. Here at NYBG, we care deeply about forests and plants, and we're very concerned about how we can contribute to their preservation. Every year, between 10 and 20 million hectares of forest are lost to development and expanding agriculture, and we all need to work together to protect our remaining forests and start to restore our lost landscapes. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists, scientists, forest managers, advocates, who have devoted their careers to understanding the essential role that forests play in sustaining our planet and our lives. And I welcome you too, our guests, for your presence. Together, we really can make a difference. I'm going to turn the mic over to our esteemed moderator, Dr. Christian Sampier, president of the Wildlife Conservation Society and newly named managing director and leader of climate solutions, uh, na climate nature solutions at the Bezos Earth Fund. And just as of last night, our brand new, our newest NYBG trustee. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and good morning to all of you, and happy Climate Week. Uh, we had a terrific lecture to warm us up, and of course, we all share this one planet. Let me start just with a personal reflection of how delighted I am that this lecture is named after Tom and Ed Lo uh, Tom Lovejoy and Ed Wilson. Uh, they were bo both uh, very close friends of mine. I met them and worked with them for more than 30 years. Uh, when I did my PhD at Harvard, Ed Wilson was one of my... Uh, uh, mentors. He was one of my teachers. I was his teaching fellow, and I learned a tremendous amount from him. And I think he's very appropriate, and there are many, many wonderful memories. And of course, Tom Lovejoy was another very dear friend who I met more than 30 years ago. I uh, went with him all the way to Camp 41, slept in the hammocks in the middle of the Amazon, and then uh, Tom had this amazing ability to sort of connect science with policy, inform things, and bring people together at Dorvis Nest, uh, where I spent many, many uh, wonderful meals and things. So. Uh, and they were both very much affiliated here with the garden. So in some ways, I'm so honored to, with the invitation to continue that torch, pick up that torch, and carry that voice on as a trustee of the garden. Anyway, we've got a terrific uh, panel today, and we're going to talk about forests and, uh, and the importance for climate. And I mean, of course, when you think about it, trees are, are carbon um, and many more things, but they really are fundamental to all life on Earth. I'm, as, as Jennifer mentioned, I've been the CEO of the Wildlife Conservation Society for the last 10 years, but I'm a botanist by training. My PhD was in botany. And I'm the obnoxious guy that goes around the field, goes to Africa, and looks at the elephants, looks at all these things, and actually asks, what is the tree that the elephant is eating? Because I'm very interested in this, and I grew up in Colombia uh, as a botanist, and my story like many tropical biologists, is I was curious about trees, nature, the Andean cloud forests. Then I realized the papers, the, the places I studied, the scientific papers I wrote, many of those places were destroyed. So the place where I did my PhD is no longer there. And that, at some point, you realize that you want to do something about it. You can't just document extinction. You can't just write papers about it. You actually want to do something about it. And that's how I sort of drifted from science into policy into environmental issues. And we have a huge battle, but a huge opportunity ahead. Because, of course, we now know that nature is so fundamental to everything we do, all of our lives, water, air, carbon, climate. And we know that the nature solutions are a fundamental part of the climate issue. And not only in remote places like the Amazon, but right here in the city like New York, and right here in the Bronx, and I've worked here for the last 10 years, and 25% of the Bronx is urban parks, 
And right here in the Botanical Garden, we've got this wonderful tea and forest that you'll hear a little bit more about. So this is not a far remote issue. Everything we do here, every tree in the cities, everything we do is a fundamental part of the solution. And we now estimate that about one third of the climate solution is gonna be coming from nature. There is no way we can meet the global goals uh, for nature and the 1.5 degree goal that's been adopted by the world in Paris without nature. And I think it's an incredible opportunity both to help understand and protect some of the natural ecosystems that we have, to restore them as well. And there's a whole conversation there about how you do restoration well, and to really also transform the way we live. And I think that's another issue. We heard some very good examples about this. So we've got a, a wonderful group of uh, panelists that are here with us today, and we're gonna talk about some of these issues. They all bring very different perspectives. I'm gonna do very quick introductions, but I'm gonna ask each of them to start by telling us a little bit more about their background and how you ended up doing what you're doing relate and how it relates to forests, which I think is interesting. So I'm gonna start right here, no particular order, but Josefina Braña, who's right next to me. She's Mexican. Uh, she's the vice president and uh, deputy leader of forest at the World Wildlife Fund, which is one of the largest conservation organizations on the planet. But she also uh, was very involved with the negotiations on climate and the Convention on Biodiversity of the United Nations and many others in Mexico. And she brings an incredible experience in terms of the forest and the policy arena. So Josefina, what's your background in just a couple minutes and how do you connect with this agenda in the forest? Uh, thanks, Christian, and, and thank you. I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here and the invitation by the New York Botanical Garden. This is a, a dream come true for me to be here with you today. Um, uh, and I, as, as Christian was saying, I'm originally from Mexico City. Um, so I grew up in, in a very, uh, you know, like a, a concrete jungle. So from a very uh, young age, I came to appreciate uh, the role of forests um, and every, I remember every time we could, uh, my parents would take me out uh, on the weekends to a nearby forest. And for me, it was a huge sense of freedom and inspiration. And I think being in the forest, uh, being so constrained in the city and then uh, having those getaways to the, to the nearby forest inspired my, instigated my curiosity. And, and that has a huge determination in, my, in, in how I follow my career pathway. So I've been working in environmental issues for more than 20 years. Uh, always exploring different ways to, to help the planet, but forests are in my soul and they always, always bring me back. Um, and and I, I think, uh, as, as Christian was saying, my, my career uh, background has also uh, been in international uh, global policy. And one of the highlights of my career was uh, being in Paris in 2015, at the time that the world came uh, to the realization that we had to have a global commitment to curb our emissions as humans and to really tackle climate change. And I had the fantastic privilege, luxury, and responsibility to be negotiating for my country, for Mexico, uh, as part of the international negotiations and working hand in hand with my peers from developed countries and developing countries and civil society to really draft and negotiate this very short but mighty Article 5 of the Paris Agreement that really clearly recognizes the, the role of forest in, in tackling climate change. It was a huge responsibility, but also uh, one of the highlights of my career. And since then, we've been seeing the growing support um, uh, for forest uh, in the role uh, in tackling climate change. Now, as Vice President and Deputy Lead uh, of Forest in, in WFUS, um, in WFUS, I have the, also the, the, the luck uh, of interacting with teams around the, the globe, uh, from Colombia to Peru, uh, Republic of Congo, Indonesia, to try to uh, put our brains together and design interventions that really can help us preserve the forest and restore the forest when they are degraded, and to really uh, bring benefits for people and nature. So it's just in the context of bringing these three pillars, benefits for people, um, nature, um, uh, that we are going to deliver benefits for climate as well. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here today and to talk more about um, um, with you about uh, forest as a force for change. Thanks, Josefina. We'll come back on some of the policy issues and the important things that are happening. Let's move on to Elliot Nagel, who is the uh, director of the Tain Family Forest. I trust you've all seen it. If you haven't, we trust you'll go there right after this talk. Uh, it is, since I've worked here at the Bronx Zoo for a number of years, I, I've told Jennifer the other day, it's one of the places where I come and escape. 
When I need a break, I actually come to Italian Family Forest, especially during warbler migration, which is fantastic as well. Uh, it's great to be right here in the city having a place like this. And you get to be the director of that forest. I'm kind of envious, but tell us a little bit more about your background and how you ended up here. Absolutely. And uh, definitely take uh, a walk in the forest if you have a chance. Uh, rain or shine, it's a beautiful place to be. Uh, so my name is Elliot Nagel. I'm the director of the Thane Family Forest. It's a 50-acre old-growth forest right here at the garden. Um, the garden has been stewarding this site for roughly 130 years. Uh, I'll talk about it a bit more. But about myself and how I got involved, I really, you know, it's a really interesting, it's kind of a similar story where I uh, was very passionate about nature, but also about the impacts on people. Uh, one of my first efforts was to uh, work on restoring a small little, uh, you know, five acre patch of woodland in a city in New Jersey. And that was, you know, I was an undergrad and just passionate about the environment. And that experience, that three year effort to really uh, build that site, uh, really inspired me to pursue this career. And um, since then, I've been working on natural resource management issues in cities ever since. And so I started off actually in water resource management, focused on green infrastructure, both with uh, the New Jersey Cooperative Extension and for the New York City DEP. Um, and then in there also working for the Forest Service um, in urban forest issues uh, in Philadelphia. And then since then, actually uh, decided to pursue forestry even further, uh, pursuing a, a, a master's degree in forestry and actually getting an opportunity to work in more rural systems out in, in Wyoming and trying to understand what can we take from our larger traditional forests that we can apply into our cities to help us better manage these spaces where people actually are and are interacting with these spaces. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, the panel. Uh, I can definitely jump in more about what we do at the forest, but um, I'll, I'll add that later, thanks. Thanks very much, Elliot, and we look forward to talking more about this because, of course, cities are a fundamental part of our future. And I think forests, botanic gardens, and others offer these windows into the world and connect us to nature. So we'll come back to this. Lucia, uh, Lucia, I actually met more than 20 years ago when she was a graduate student at the University of Missouri in St. Louis and the Missouri Botanical Garden. But you've been in this, uh, Lucia is from Brazil. So you've got a, a heavy Latin American representation of the panel, which is fine. <laughs> um, but Lucia is a professor at the University of Sao Paulo, and she's also the director of something called the Association of Tropical Biology and Conservation, which is an association, she'll tell you more about it, of tropical biologists that are interested in doing science, understanding this. I started out, and they published a wonderful journal. And then a few years ago, many years ago now, they actually added the word conservation, which was good. So going more into becoming active. And Lucia has done a lot of research in biogeography of uh, Amazonian plants and others. So she's a scientist, but a hands-on scientist. But Lucia, Thank a little you. bit more about the detail there and how you ended up here. Uh, it's great to see you again. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, a pleasure to see you again and to meet the new panelists. And a pleasure to see Doug again, who I'm also known for more than maybe 30 years now. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> so, yeah, as Cristian said, I'm originally from Sao Paulo, and like Cristian, Josefina, and yeah, Elliot, I also had a very strong connection with nature since I was a child. So, even though I grew up in Sao Paulo, which is a large city, I was always out playing in nature and was really always fascinated by the diversity of things in Sao Paulo, particularly of plants. So my mom was always very interested in plants. She was always telling me names of different things. And I actually used to collect stamps and only stamps of plants. <laughs> and so we had friends and even people from different countries sending me stamps for my collection, which I still have until today. And, but I was also interested in animals. And in fact, there's a story that I've been known for in Brazil for a while. I had a butt fly when I was little and I went to a doctor to take it out and I asked him to keep it in a vial so I could take it home and keep feeding the butt fly. <laughs> And, and so that shows like uh, maybe an interest in nature and science since very early on, because not everybody is interested in that kind of level of detail. And of course, so being in Brazil and always being around, especially the Atlantic forest, I was always intrigued about, you know, where did these plants come from? And how come that we have this amazing biodiversity here? 
that is not really found everywhere in the world. And like, what are the mechanisms that led to all this diversity? And these are exactly the kinds of questions that I actually address today in my research. So what I do is to first document biodiversity, and especially plants, which is not trivial in Brazil. So we just finished a first catalog where we have been able to document 50,000 species of plants, but we know that that's just a first step and just a beginning. And at the same time, I also study where did these plants come from, so including a paleontological component and also climatology and geology. And what is really valuable about that is that so we are able to understand the past, which gives us really important information to predict the future. And I guess predicting the future is one of the most important things we can do. I mean, if we think about you know, like the businesses that thrive, they thrive because people were able to predict the future. And also if we think about the schools that thrive, that thrive and the universities because they were able to prepare students for the future. So really understanding the past and how these plants originated and how all this diversity uh, emerged is really critical for these predictions into the future. And so and in addition to my research um, on really documentation of biodiversity. In more recent years, I've become much more involved also thinking about, okay, so how can we connect this information also into policy and also communicate this information in different ways? So I've started also to establish a series of partnerships with artists and thinking about art science exhibits and different ways to connect, to communicate about science. And at the ATBC, we also do a lot of science outreach, a lot of capacity building in different parts of the world, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and um, especially, in, and it's, yeah, through our journal and through um, annual meetings that we host every year. In fact, this year was just in Colombia, in Cartagena. We were sorry you couldn't attend next time. And which is also a wonderful way to connect scientists with also society, policymakers, and you know, make our contribution. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Obrigado por você. <laughs> On to uh, Doug Daly, uh, who's a legend in, in his own right. I mean, the work that he's done here and studying, uh, he's a systematic botanist by training. He's the director of the Institute of Systematic Botany here at the Garden. I think those of us that started out uh, early on in life doing botany have always admired the incredible work that the garden does and the deep knowledge that people at Doug and others have in understanding and documenting the diversity of this planet. In his case, Bursaraceae, which is one of the most important families there. Uh, but Doug, I mean, you've led the way and you, along with your colleagues here, but tell us a little bit more about your background. How did you end up studying these things and here at the garden and your collection with Forrest? Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for coming. It's, it's great to be here with this really stimulating group, and I, I loved the, the the first talk. It was it was rather, it was almost evangelical about uh, about climate. So it was it was really a great great inspiration. Um, I'm the I probably have the longest title of anybody at the botanical garden. I am director of the Institute of Systematic Botany and the B. A. Krukoff Curator of Amazonian Botany. So figure that out. Um, I was, uh, I was very, very fortunate to study uh, at Harvard with Richard Schultes, who was a great Amazon explorer, and then later studied with uh, Ian Prance, who was another great Amazon explorer who was based here. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, I, I see myself as following in, the, in their tradition, and they've, um, I guess I, I, would, I would hope that you would more easily find me in the field than in front of a computer or in, in, the, in a laboratory, and I actually did a count uh, not too long ago, I realized that I have been on more than 100 field expeditions. Mm. So that's even, that's even more telling than what you were saying <laughs> about how long we've known each other. Um, but anyway, I, I've, uh, as you can tell, I've, I studied uh, the Amazon. Uh, I've, I've concentrated mostly in the southwestern Amazon, which when I started, was uh, some 25, 30 years ago, uh, was a black hole of biodiversity, as we called it. I'd say it's probably now maybe a brown hole. It's uh, we've we've made some progress. Um, we have a long way to go, but it's it's a it's a remarkable part of the world. Uh, my vehicle, I say, as as, as uh, Christian said, my vehicle for studying the Amazon is the Bursaraceae, which is the frankincense and myrrh tree. Uh, you find people using the the resin of this tree or, or relatives of this tree all over the tropics, 
uh, for the same purposes, you know, for ritual and for, uh, for, um, for medicinal purposes and, and quite, a, quite a number of, of uses. Uh, actually, stealing canoes, for some reason, is, is people all over the world in the tropics use Bursaraceae resin to steal canoes. Um, the Bursaraceae is, it gives, is, as with Lucia, who studies the big new Anaesia, and I hope she'll have a chance to talk to you about, about her work on that. Uh, these, we, we call them a kind of model organisms. They're, they're organisms that we can use uh, if, we, if we can really just get into them and decipher them quite a bit and understand their past and, their, and perhaps their future, uh, we can get an idea of, uh, of patterns of biodiversity. And we can, we can also, um, uh, I, th I think if there's one thing that, that I hope we can take away here, that's among other, many other messages, is that uh, there's, there's a very, very tight connection uh, between systematics, which is, as I say, my training is, and climate. It's, uh, if you, um, I've expanded, let's say, from the burst race to, to, be able to a really strong interest, especially the, in the Amazon, but in general, in how people can identify trees. Because when you have thousands and thousands of species of trees, you need, you need some really good strategies for, for figuring that out. Um, and if you don't figure that out, if you're not able to put names on things, then really it's, it's, everything is just an exercise, uh, in, an intellectual exercise, let's say. Uh, they become what I call fictitious forests, and uh, if at some point, uh, I hope that I'll be able to return to this and talk about it because uh, these fictitious forests are, are the ones that are, these are the ones where people are basing uh, the management and the and supposedly the conservation of resources uh, without having really a, any idea of what they are. We just uh, they get names thrown on them, and uh, they're they're like I said, it's not not particularly useful. Uh, then, most recently, uh, I've uh, really been trying to dedicate a lot of energy and use what I've, my background in trying to help uh, train people in the forest. So it's instead of training just graduate students or interns or something like that, uh, I have a program where we're actually going to different communities in the Amazon and training them in very basic uh, planet tree, tree identification, uh, but also a little bit of how, to, how they can monitor the resources that are most important to them. And uh, so one thing uh, I, I realized quite a long time ago is that there aren't very many of me or us, should I say, with Lucia. Um, so we really need, we need to essentially train and recruit uh, people who are in the forest and who are really on the, in the front line there. Well, thanks, Doug, and thank you and your, all your colleagues for the work that you do. I think, I think one of the things that we don't realize, I mean, there are somewhere north of 400,000 plant species that uh, and that we share the planet with, and many of them are trees. But we, we sort of feel sometimes that we already know what's out there. And what most, many people don't realize is we're still documenting and describing and discovering new species and understanding not only putting names on them, which is important, but understanding their distribution. And very importantly, trying to understand now what are, how, how are things changing? What is the role that they have? And of course, trees and forests have been fundamental for the lives of indigenous peoples, local communities that to, have been in living these areas for thousands of years. And that traditional knowledge is fundamental. And yet, one of the things that really strikes me when I go to some of these places, you, they're noticing changes. These communities that are living out there are seeing changes that are coming out there. We're seeing more droughts. We're seeing more floods in some areas. We're seeing, a, the, the world is changing. The, there's an indigenous group in the northern part of Colombia called the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta. And there's wonderful set of tribes there that really hung on to their identity for the last 500 years. And they consider themselves the elder brothers. And we are the younger brothers. And uh, I remember many years ago, Sir David Attenborough went to do a documentary there about this. And they had a message for the world. Uh, and the message was, the world is changing faster and faster. And they couldn't quite understand where it was coming from. They said, you, have, you the younger brothers, have to really change the way you're doing things because our livelihoods and our way of being is really changing fast. So I think there's a, there's, we're seeing changes all around us. We're seeing changes right here in New York. We've seen it. Those of us that have lived here for a while, we've seen Hurricane Sandy. We've seen the impacts that this has had. It's impacting trees. It's impacting, we're seeing more and more droughts and things. And I think we're at a point right now where both the changes and the climate change that are happening are impacting forests. And yet the forests are a huge part of the solution for, to be able to deal with this. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into some of these topics. Let me start a little bit on the science piece 
We'll come back into the cities and we'll come back to the policy. I want to dig a little bit deeper on this and then we'll look at the cross-cutting issues. But let's start a little bit more on the on the science just to look at this. I mean, how, how much do we know at this point uh, about these issues? And what are we noticing? Say, Lucia, I mean, you've done a lot of work in biogeography and things. Are we seeing changes in these trees and the species that are out there? And how are, how are trees and forests responding to the impacts of climate? Well... So actually, I want to start by mentioning, you said how much we know, and I want to emphasize, sometimes it's hard for people to understand how little we still know in terms of biodiversity. So in general, we estimate that we have only documented around 10% of the world's biodiversity, and this is worldwide. For plants specifically, we estimate that we only have good information on the taxonomy, which is the name, the traits and the distribution and the genetics for around 17% of the species we know. So if we only know 10%, and of this 10%, we only have good information for 17% is this world of unknown uh, biodiversity, right? And, and so, and if we think about forests and the change that we are seeing is we're losing forests and we're losing a lot of species that we don't even know the name, much less how they function and their role in the ecosystems. And we talk a lot about ecosystem function, but we need to remember that there's a lot of additional functions that we don't even realize either. So there's a lot of known unknowns that we know we don't know. And then also a lot of unknown unknowns, which are things that we don't even re realize that we don't know and that the impacts of forest deforest well of deforestation are going to be even more severe than we can possibly imagine and i think i've extended myself too much and i'll let doug compliment with the yeah, I'll, I'll try and add a little bit of drama to this um, <laughs> they, well it's dramatic for me anyway but, the, but uh, it's it's amazing to i, I always have to remind myself that uh, every two days, on average, a new species of plant is described from Brazil. So that's, that's one way of expressing it. Another way of expressing it is uh, there are the, the most common tree around Manaus, you know, where Tom Lovejoy had that wonderful mm -hmm. experiment. They, and so this area was very heavily inventoried and very well sampled. And uh, so it turned out that there's this one species there uh, is the most common tree around, around central Amazon. Uh, it is probably represented by uh, one billion individuals throughout the Amazon, and until 2018, it didn't have a name. And there are many, many cases like that, but that's the most dramatic one I know. It's, uh, but it, it is, it is uh, just stunning sometimes to think about that, but it, it's, uh, you know, as we learned from the, 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 the keynote talk, it's, it's, uh, it's the, the message is not despair. The message is you just have to speed up and, and uh, just resolve. And you mentioned Manaus, and let me, as a tribute to Tom Lovejoy, just mention something. Um, Tom did one of the most uh, large-scale, innovative, and visionary experiments. He had this wonderful area when he was at the World Wildlife Fund. And there was a big debate in the scientific community about what happens when you lose forests. And the whole idea of uh, you need big areas to conserve them, but what happens when you end up with relatively small fragments? And that was a big scientific debate at the time. And Tom did this massive experiment, still running to this day, about looking at some of these areas and frontiers of deforestation, parts of the Amazon, and basically directed this and saying, we're going to leave fragments of forest of different sizes. So some big areas, some small areas, and then study them long term. So I think one of the things that we don't always understand is we need to document these changes and we want to really be able to do it. And Tom did a, a massive scale of the, around Camp 41 and everything he did. And it really taught us some of the insights and, and made really gave us the science to underpin the importance of preserving forest and preserving contiguous large areas of forest as well. Because I think one of the things that we're seeing now more and more, we know that as humans, we've transformed about 73% of the surface of the planet terrestrially, uh, which is big when you think about it, just a couple hundred years. And one of the things we need to do is to hold on to some of these places. But we know we need to hold on to large places. 
because really small areas get degraded very, very quickly. And the science is telling us more and more that we're seeing many species will not survive given these fragments. I think it was a really good example of how we can use the science to inform the decisions that are being made in the policy arena. Um, and I think that's just one example of what we're looking at there. Um, and, and let me come to you, Josefina, maybe a little bit about how do we use that kind of information? And you mentioned in your role with forests, I mean, World Wildlife Fund has this amazing footprint globally where you work in America, you work in Africa, you work in others, but how do we use that science to inform the policy? And, how, and, and what do we know and what do we not know? And, and how, just go a little bit deeper in the policy. Of course, I mean, uh Catherine, uh, the, our keynote uh, speaker this morning, uh, was uh, rem taking us to the 1800s, right? Like uh, we have known this information, evidence, etc. But it has taken so long for us to have a breakthrough and say, like, okay, the science is saying that. How does that translate in action? And that, for me, um, uh, being in Paris and engaging the negotiations was crucial to to really enshrine the role of forests in the Paris Agreement very explicitly, because I think it sends the signal from the global level that all countries, by consensus, are agreeing, yes, forests are important. And then you start getting like this trickle-down effect of like action, and then you start seeing nationally determined contributions, the, com the commitments that countries are submitting in terms of re re cutting their emissions, including forests there. But it takes a while, and it's um, a little bit frustrating that uh, we have evidence, as you were saying, from indigenous peoples, local communities, that have been the first line of defense against deforestation, um, and they have the knowledge and, and traditional, uh, you know, like a, a culture of um, a, living in harmony with forests. And we, as a humanity, uh, have ignored those uh, that, that knowledge. So now, what I'm seeing is like this twisters effect in which. The Paris Agreement and the global policy sending the signal uh, of political commitment and relevance. And the bottom-up um, uh, initiatives are still ongoing, and they need that kind of like reinforcement, energy, finance, support, political will uh, to really be able to scale up and to be replicated and have that, uh, that impact. Um, but from my side, uh, I think it was a battle. Um, and I, I think like forests were seen like a nice to have thing in the political space, like, oh, forests are nice, and yes, you're a nice community, go to your corner and talk about forests. Uh, but the reality is that as science has been advancing and the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has been digging more in the science, it has become clear that forests are not a nice to have, they are a must have. And that became like the, the, the pathway of like really talking about the science. It's not only about like the, the report is there in the drawer, but it's actually socializing, talking about it, bringing real life examples that ha help us have that breakthrough and to, to bring um, the recognition in the Paris Agreement of Forests. Forests are so crucial and essential for human life. It, from filtering the water we drink and uh, the air we breathe and providing us like all sorts of um, uh, products and ecosystem services, but they are also super essential for climate change because they have this double effect, right? Like they are part of the problem at the moment because when we deforest and, and when we do uh, land use change, emissions are, uh, greenhouse gases are emitted to the atmosphere, so it uh, exacerbates climate change. But forests are also uh, unique in their capacity to absorb and remove carbon from the atmosphere. And not only removing the carbon, but actually storing them. Storing carbon for ages uh, in their roots, in their uh, in their um, organic matter. So it, it's a uh, it's a no regret investment if you think about it. Like, well, you stop deforestation because then you manage to address almost a quarter of emissions, like the global emissions that we release because of land use change to the atmosphere. And not only that, you are actually capturing the carbon uh, and keep it in the ground. So it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a no regret solution that has been now recognized and now it has to be equally supported um, with finance, with political will, um, and, and we are starting seeing that. In the UNFCCC, uh, last COP in Glasgow, the, the, the climate negotiations in Glasgow, this climate week we are seeing nature very high up in the political agenda when we talk about climate. So I think like there's there's hope there. Thanks, Josefina. And you know what? Maybe some of you saw a wonderful video that was done a 
I think about a year and a half ago or so, by one of the young activists, Greta Thunberg, uh, with George, George Bombiot. And if you haven't seen it, it's wonderful. But the whole idea is we're, we're trying to figure out how we tackle the climate crisis and say, well, we need technology. Yes, yeah, so we need to change our energy and we need to do all that. I said, but we need to invent a technology that can take carbon out of the air and put it there. And the whole point is, yeah, we have it. It's called a tree. Um, and that's what it does. I mean, when you think about it, fundamentally, a plant and a tree, what they're doing is basically taking carbon dioxide and through photosynthesis, doing cellulose and building and growing, storing that carbon and then releasing oxygen. That's a simple version, sort of. Uh, that's what I learned in my PhD. Uh, but but uh, there's a lot more to it. And actually, one of the things that we're seeing now, of course, is the, the whole area of what we call the below ground biomass. We think of trees and forests, but what we don't, we're starting to realize is the incredible ecosystem that's there, not only in the trees, but below ground and the roots and all these areas is unbelievable. And we're, we're barely, that's an area that we are just starting to discover. The good news is we've got tools and technologies now that allow us to gain insights into the science that are extraordinary. But I think one of the challenges that we have is we see that every time you cut down a forest, we look at the, the they release, and as the trees degrade and the cellulose breaks down, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. And you think it's not much, but the latest data and the latest analysis is that about 11% of the global emissions of carbon come from deforestation. 11%, that's more than the entire transportation system of the planet combined. So clearly one of the first things we need to do is help protect these forests and protect these trees. And you know what, if you leave them alone, one of the things we know now is bigger trees, absorb more carbon, they've got these incredible carbon stocks. And let me just give you one statistic that's, I just learned a few weeks ago, it's really striking. The global emissions in carbon that we estimate, is somewhere around 45 gigatons, billion tons of carbon per year released into the atmosphere. And yet, what that doesn't take into account is the amount of carbon that's stored in some of these forests. And for the Amazon, we estimate the Amazon has at least 200 gigatons of carbon, which is it's burned down in terms of emissions, it's huge. And the other very important system are what are called peatlands. And there's one gigantic peatland in the Congo Basin that we have been studying at WCS and looking at this, one peatland in the Congo rainforest that contains more than 50 gigatons of carbon if we lose that one peatland, that's the equivalent of all the global emissions of CO2 in the planet every year. So it just shows that one of the first things we need to do is leave it alone, protect some of the areas that we have. But then the beauty is we've learned that nature can really come back and can be restored. And when you regrow and restore forests and things, you accumulate carbon again, and you can really do this and store it. And this is a way to really, it's a really key part of the solution. Now, some parts of the world we're seeing active loss of forests. Parts of southern Brazil are very example, poster child, and Lucia may want to come back to that. But the good news is we know nature comes back. And there are parts of the world where forests have come back. And one of the areas is right here, the northeastern part of the United States. When you think about it 200 years ago, many areas were cleared. But we actually have more forests now in the northeastern part of the United States than we did 100 years ago. And of course, we, one of the best examples of the role of forests for a city like New York is right here with the Catskill Mountains and the visionary people that protected that. And the forest that we drink every day here in New York is an ecosystem service from the forest. So I think it's just a good issue. But I think we can really come back and restore it. And of course, let me move on to cities and come back to you earlier. Because cities are a fundamental part. I mean, one of the big challenges we face as humans is how do we have 10 billion people in the future on the planet and feed them without destroying the planet. And part of the solution is cities. More people living in cities, more efficient. And yet cities are these incredible urban spaces, jungles like Mexico City and Sao Paulo and some of these others. And yet these green areas, like the botanical garden, like these forests, are amazing. And one of the wonderful things is we have some of those remnants of the original forests here, left right here in the forest. So tell us a little bit more about these urban forests. Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting. So you touched on some of this, but um, like some of the most recent information out there is that over half of the world's population is living in cities, over four point something billion people, right? That's a number that's been increasing steadily over recent decades. 
Um, but growing at a rate even faster than that is actually urban land area. So urban land area globally is growing at a rate one and a half times that of urban populations. So when we're thinking about these things like fragmentation of our forested landscapes, this is something that will become more and more important into the future as our cities and uh, begin to grow. And it's interesting when we're thinking about efficiency, right? Because that is where we are encouraging a lot of growth is in kind of concentrated areas. Um, what's interesting in the US, 68% uh, of the parkland in our cities across the country is actually natural spaces. These are areas that are naturally regenerating, um, not necessarily street trees and parks, right? These are just natural forested areas mostly. Um, but by and large, we have a limited understanding similar to, uh, you know, dare I say it, similar to the Amazon, right? <laughs> we still have a limited understanding um, um, of these systems. And a lot of that comes from the fact that these are areas, uh, these forested areas in our cities are, have long been undervalued and understudied. Um, so when we're thinking about understanding long-term changes, guiding management, um, that's something that we don't have a lot of throughout the country. We're really lucky here at the Botanical Garden because we actually, we've been stewarding the site for 130 years. It was stewarded prior to that, and it actually had avoided what you were saying, that agricultural land clearing in the 17 and 1800s. Um, and we've been collecting data on that system for the last, like I said, 130 years. So we, um, what we're doing is, we're, we're look, right now one of the projects we're doing is looking at how this forest has changed over time, um, which helps build kind of our framework and our understanding of how these systems are impacted long term. Um, but why do we care, right? So urban forests, you've seen this kind of already in the presentation and some people have talked about it, but um, they're important for human health, right? So uh, water and air pollution is remediated by our urban forests, um, but they're also important for wildlife. So when we're thinking about habitat connectivity, um, having these forested areas in our cities are really important for sustaining the wildlife of those systems. Um, so that's something that's a lot of what we're doing here, and we collect that data um, on how it's changing, which guides our management into the future. Uh, yeah. And then, Elliot, I mean, there are very few places on the planet where we have these long-term data sets. Yeah. I mean, Manaus is a very good example, but 100 years is a lot of data. Yeah. What are we seeing? So, what is the science telling us about how is this forest changing? Understanding it's a yeah. relatively small piece in the jungle of areas, but what, what have we learned? There's a couple things. So this is something I'm actually looking at right now, currently. I think the biggest thing that's really surprising and kind of interesting to see um, which aligns with the fact that this is a forest that's very old, is that the structure of the forest overall has really been relatively steady. So uh, that's in terms of a couple things called basal area density, so how big the trees are throughout the site, how much space the trees take up, how many of them there are. That's been relatively stable. And that's interesting because that is all of the information that guides our calculations to things like carbon sequestration or things um, associated with climate, associated with wildlife, associated with uh, um, habitat health, such as remediating water and air pollution. A lot of that's associated with forest structure. So that's one of the big thing, big takeaways right now is we're seeing that. And then we're also seeing that the diversity of the systems increasing over time, steadily, every, after every inventory year. So that's big takeaways still yet to draw more conclusions, but I'll get back to you. And one of the things I've, I've been affiliated with for many years is something called the Center for Tropical Forest Science, which is a set of networks around the world, including one in Barro Colorado in Panama, that are sort of long-term places where you're monitoring, measuring these trees over time, decades. And the question is, how fast are they growing? Uh, how fast are trees dying? How is it changing in issues? And some of the plots what we're seeing right now is that the trees seem to be growing faster is quite interesting and it's not entire, not everywhere huh. there are areas where there's drought and they're growing slower but some areas that we're seeing faster so people say it, it actually may be tied to some of the climate change and carbon are, are we seeing any of that here um i don't know if i could say that for a fact uh, the the rate in which individual trees are growing is not something that we're recording in our data set it's more on a forest scale how is the forest uh, on a whole changing over time. Um, and so what we are seeing is changes in species composition. Um, and there are many reasons possibly for that. That could be impacts from industrialization of the city, right? So changes in air quality impacting regeneration of species, um, but also natural processes. So we're seeing natural succession take place in certain areas as well. So we are seeing changes, but more on the lines of composition. And I have one more, though. I'm yeah, going to come fine. to you, Lucia. I'm going to ask you a little bit about 
Sao Paulo as well, but also what's happening. For, but how do we use that kind of knowledge? I mean, New York is a yes. city that's changing right now. It's transforming, which is great. So mentioned that many people don't realize that 25% of the, the Bronx is actually parks, which is unbelievable when you think about it. And there's more efforts to do plant trees. How can we use the kind of science and knowledge we have from some of the forest to help in the efforts to green a city like New York? So specifically what we do here is uh, we have an adaptive management practice, which in, essentially means that we take this information that we have. So we do a five year, we do inventory every five years, see how it's changing. And that guides kind of our assessment of what we're going to do in that system in the forest for the next five years, right? It also allows us to see how it's changed. Now that's a model that I think the city is actually starting to take. There are some uh, larger citywide uh, efforts at doing kind of large scale inventories of our forests. The first just occurring a couple of years ago. But that is, the, uh, you know, I think really important moving forward is we need to have that information to see what to do next and whether or not what we've been doing is successful. The other thing is um, we need, uh, you know, help doing this. So there's a lot of uh, organizations out there that are uh, stewarding forests. I'm sure if there's a small forest by you somewhere, there's an organization tied to it. Uh, and, and they all need some type of help or assistance in achieving these goals. And so a lot of that, you know, is not necessarily, you don't have to be a botanist to do that. Um, but whatever skill set you have, that is likely helpful. So whether you're an educator or you can help with social media or you just want to garden and weed plants, you know, all of that is something that I think is really important um, for all of these organizations. And so I think that's a, an important step forward is figuring out how we can all um, take part in it. All right, thanks. Lucia, I'm going to throw a curveball to you, but you, you come from Sao Paulo, another big city of issues. Can you tell us a little bit what's happening with these urban forests in Sao Paulo? So, yeah, Sao Paulo is a big city and growing by the hour, by the way. And, but the value of these forests is just incredible. The, so we have different forests in town. And one thing that I keep thinking a lot is well, and the talk today got us to think about that. How do we go from head to heart and to hand, right? And so I give a lot of talks and telling people about the number of species that are going extinct and how we need to care about this and how it's going to be, how it's difficult, and how Catherine showed really well, these things seem very far away, right? And when we're in Sao Paulo and when we take people to these forests, everything changes. I don't need to tell them about any species going extinct. I don't need to say anything. Once they are in the forest, they already realize the value and the magnitude of biodiversity and the need to preserve it. So I think they are really, and they really, the ones we have, so there's this huge value in terms of, of outreach of just people going there and science communication, but also these forests are serving as museums of place. So in some way, so we are trying to understand everything we can about those four. So we do anatomical studies, we get their leaves to do DNA extractions. We try to record, record their growth rates and see these changes over time. And the value we can get from these museums of place that we can understand really deeply, I think is enormous. Christiane, I wonder if I could just interject a quick Please. thing. Uh, uh, an element of hope um, going from Sao Paulo, the gigantic city of Sao Paulo in New York, or also uh, to the very modest capital city of Acre in, in uh, southwest of the Amazon. Uh, so the Rio Branco is, is the capital, and there is a municipal park there that is a remnant of, uh, it's, actually it was a second for, secondary forest, but it's, it's, it's coming along and regenerating very nicely. Uh, it's being, uh, they are having uh, school groups going through this park. They are having events that are they were called the, calling informata, which means in, you know, information about the, the forest. Um, also having QR code uh, tours of, of, you know, of the special trees that are that are found in this place. So I think you know, obviously inspired by other efforts, you know, in bigger towns. But it's 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 really gratifying to see it that being replicated on even at that scale. So. Yeah, I, th I think. Um Part of what we're seeing right now is that these cities are, are changing. I mean, they've become better, more sustainable in so many ways. Green roofs changing the way we live, but these green spaces are really critical, to your point. And actually, I think that's what the botanical garden here does. It offers a green space in this urban jungle 
It's a place where we can connect with nature. I often describe it as windows into nature, and I think that really makes a point. And one of my favorite terms, someone, I forget what was coined a term many years ago, called the nature deficit disorder. And it's the whole idea that people are, as they become increasingly disconnected from nature, uh, we sort of forget who we are and where we come from. And, and there is more and more behavioral science that's now showing us that when you go back into these areas and you spend time in a forest and reconnect with nature, it changes you. I mean, it really brings you, it makes you whole in a wonderful way. And I think what we're seeing is a big effort right now uh, to, to bring back some of these green areas and plant trees in cities. And I think there's a whole movement. I predict the next 10 years, we're going to see a massive greening of the cities, uh, starting here in New York, but across the US and around the world. And there's some big efforts around this, which I think are going to be very important. And now, they're, now we're seeing big global goals. I mean, there's an initiative, two initiatives actually have the same name, done by different groups called Trillion Trees. And the whole idea is um, a goal to plant one trillion trees in the planet. Um, now, when you think about it, there are probably about four trillion trees right now. There probably were about seven, so we've lost a lot, but it's an interesting goal. And one thing I've learned is uh, politicians love numbers like that, right? So you sort of have to go there, and then, then one, one of the things I've seen, and you may want to comment on this, in Davos, when one of these initiatives launched, every president was out there saying, I'm going to plant 400,000 trees, and the next one's going to say, I'm going to plant 500. This is healthy competition. <laughs> So we want them to do more. The problem is you have to plant the right trees in the right places. You have to look after them, and you need to make sure you do it well. But this is healthy. But you want to talk a little bit or pick up on this, Josefina? Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention something. I mean, the, the, the trillion trees uh, situation, I think it's brilliant in terms of marketing because it helps people connect, right? Everybody can un understand and imagine ourselves planting a tree. So that has been brilliant in terms of, of uh, marketing. But I actually wanted to, to just uh, go back a little bit to the, to the linkages between forest and health, because we uh, actually just released a, a, a report, the vitality of forest. And there's actually scientific evidence uh, to support what you're saying, Christian, in terms of the um, uh, relationship between uh, spending time in forest and a, a, a direct impact in the non-communicable diseases, like cardiovascular diseases, uh, respiratory, uh, chronic uh, respiratory diseases, or um, hypertension, mental health. There is scientific evidence that show that people spending uh, time in forest have an impact and, and a decrease in the risks of uh, contracting this or, or developing these uh, non-communicable diseases. Um, at the same time, uh, the um, the hormone, the stress hormones uh, that our body produces when when we are uh, stressed out and and we are um, yeah subjected to the urban environment. Uh, if you spend time in the forest, you will see a huge impact in your cortisol levels, in your adrenaline levels, etc. So that's, we're very very excited about the scientific findings uh, of this report, um, and of course. We all know and have in our minds uh, the coronavirus pandemic, right? And uh, just want to mention that we found that one in three outbreaks of zoonotic diseases are directly related to deforestation. So even more, you know, like another reason of why uh, it's not only about climate. If you really another, need another like personal compelling reason, the linkage between forest and health is, is, is really out there and we should be talking about it more. No, that's a good point, because we often forget we're part of nature. And of course, uh, I mean, I think the COVID pandemic has really brought this point home. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing now more and more, I mean, about 70% of all the diseases actually have their origin animals, clearly, that spill over. A lot through bushmeat and, and other issues. It's something we work in the Wildlife Conservation Society with people eating bushmeat and things. And that's what's called the spillover effect, so sort of when spills over from wildlife to humans. But we're seeing more and more of this happening. And some of it is tied to deforestation. And I think it's getting, we're getting better data. So yeah, there, there are many reasons to protect forests uh, in our connections, whether it's here in New York or around the world because of uh, the livelihood and things. So let, let me come back to the panel and maybe ask you the following. So I mean, given the challenges, given the opportunities, given the importance of forests, what are the things that give you the most hope right now that you're seeing out there? What are the things that you say, wow, this is really the best way to stewardship this relationship with forests and the things that we're seeing. Doug, why don't we start with you? Uh, well, actually, you, 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 you kind of uh, 
I, I think I might have anticipated that question when I was talking about the, that the urban forest in, in, in Akari, which is that kind of, of, uh, of effort, you know, that it's, it's a, it, at least on the scale of it, it's a grassroots effort, but it's something that really could easily be uh, replicated and, and, and copied. Um, but in terms of, of actual hope, um, I think I see the, the dedication of, of people who are, who are tasked with, with preserving forests. It's something that's really overlooked quite a bit. Uh, the, when I was thinking about uh, who, who are the people who could, um, who could preserve the forest, and at least in, in Brazil, and I came down, I came up with this, the answer was, um, it was the civil servants. So the, there was an effort actually on the part of some government people to, uh, to be able to, to fire any civil servant they wanted, which really would have, could have and would have gutted the, 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 uh, uh, all the agencies that work with the environment and, and with climate in, in Brazil. But um, these people, the people who stayed and who could not be, and who were, they had their budgets taken away from them, they had their re infrastructure taken away from them. And when you have that kind of resolve, and, and you know, they, they will prevail. And uh, I think that's, that's one of the most hopeful indications I've seen. Uh, Lucia. Yeah, I think local communities and seeing their voices heard now, and we now see this whole movement with so diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what people were doing on the ground, really their voices started to, starting to scaling up and really being heard throughout the world. And I also, another thing that is giving me a lot of hope are the networks that are being established. So we really need all these local initiatives, but we also need these amazing networks of people working at different levels and helping each other. So at both levels, right? So from the local communities and being scaled up and also from up helping these communities. And I think these networks are just crucial. We are at the time, you know, the one world philosophy of it's not Brazil, it's not Colombia, it's not Mexico, it's not the US, every country. So everybody really working together without thinking, oh no, this is good for Brazil or no, this is good for all of us. And, what happens in the Amazon matters everywhere. So just seeing this network and the voices scaling up and messages reaching different parts of the globe, I think this gives me a lot of hope and optimism. Aliyah. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. Um, I think, uh, you know, it really, what for me, at least what inspires me uh, on like a day-to-day -day basis is just seeing everyone's reaction, just personal reaction entering a forested area, coming out of one of the densest urban areas in the country, um, and then entering that space. And especially children, there's like this, uh, you know, a camp of kids that I, I take in and like talk about trees and stuff every summer. Um, and seeing their reaction, you know, regardless of where they're coming from, regardless of background, like just full, um, just fully, uh, you know, engaged and inspired. Um, and the same, I think, could be said for, you know, visitors of all ages that enter the space. And I think that's, that's really inspiring and just goes to show the importance of maintaining these spaces, um, not only in rural environments, but also in, in areas where people have access to that. And I, and I think that we have, and this is something that I think Doug was touching on as well, that by creating those connections um, at a very simple level, we have the ability to build a network of people that are interested in environmental issues, that are interested in climate issues. I mean, it starts at that very local scale. And so that's, uh, that's kind of what inspires me on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. Great, well, Sophia. Well, for me, what inspires me is that I feel like forests are having a little bit of a moment in the spotlight. <laughs> uh, because we're seeing it here in Climate Week, but I, as I mentioned uh, last year at the COP, we're seeing the nature and forest discussions more and more uh, high up in the political agenda. And we are seeing, uh, we are starting to see action triggering from, from the Paris Agreement. Uh, 80 percent of uh, the nationally determined contributions, the, the climate commitments that countries need to submit to the UN, 80% uh, include some sort of action on forest. So that gives me hope because that will have to translate in re results, hopefully. Um, but also 
it gives me hope to see that it's not only governments, but there is a huge traction that we are seeing uh, on corporations. The private sector is stepping up, and we are seeing more and more companies adopting science-based targets to decarbonize themselves and to support nature-based solutions as forest protection and forest restoration uh, to achieve those targets um, and to go actually above, above and beyond of their own uh, reduction cuts. Um, it gives me hope to see, um, you know, like we just launched um, an expansion uh, of our um, partnership with HP of $80 million to really um, protect, restore, and promote better sustainable management of forests to deliver benefits for people and for climate, um, for nature and climate. So it's like these like more integrated approaches that are not siloed, but actually like more like partnerships, public and private, uh, people going out of their corners and trying to really tackle complexity and uh, acknowledge that deforestation is messy and is complex and we need to come together. That gives me hope uh, because I feel like we, we, um, we, we need to acknowledge that this is uh, a cross-cutting issue that for saving the forest, we need to look at all the, all the um, tools that we have there. And finally, I feel like we are starting to see finance uh, being committed at the scale that is needed. Um, last year in Glasgow, uh, we saw uh, the Glasgow Leaders Declaration, uh, uh, which resulted in a commitment of $19 billion, around $19 billion for forests and for indigenous peoples and local communities to be supported in their efforts. Um, $19 billion are dwarfed by the $700 billion, billion yeah, $19, $19 billion are dwarfed by the $700 or $800 billion that are fueled into the production of commodities that causes 90% of the deforestation, right? Soy, palm oil, pulp and paper, beef. That uh, we are still very, very far away from this, like the, these 19 billion dollars are very far away to, to equal that. But it gives me hope that we are seeing like very concrete steps and, and that we are, um, again, the, the, the sense of um, partnership and alignment as opposed to everybody wanting to do their own thing, uh, it gives me hope. Uh, let me tie it back to, to the people who are honoring with this lecture for a moment, because they were both uh, incredible people. Starting the policy, uh, Tom Lovejoy was an incredible person, had this ability, he, he was respected and loved by the scientific community, but he would take that knowledge into the boardrooms, into decision makers at the World Bank and many others, held by Carbon and others, to really look at this and how to make this information available and to, he was a spokesperson in the right places at the right times and I know he he had a profound influence. Some, I bet you, some of you can tell me, but rumor has it that Tom over the years took about two thirds of the members of the United States Congress to Camp 41 to sleep at these hammocks and things. And I've met some of those members of Congress who say that was such a transformative experience. And these were Republicans, Democrats, everything. It really showed the ability to, Tom had this ability to bring them there, take them to the forest, inspire them, and, and give them the issue. And then he was always available to take that information and to be by their side to help them do this. And I think that that, that ability, I think the impact that someone like Tom had in, in the global policy arena is something uh, inspiring in so many ways. And then Ed Wilson, who, uh, many of you know, was a, a gifted writer. I mean, just amazing. Won the Pulitzer Prize many times and I read many of his books and things. He actually wrote a, a wonderful book about, about probably five years ago, so called Half Earth. And it was really interesting. And it's his ploy, it was sort of his argument about we need to protect, give half of the planet to nature and the other half for us. I mean, it's a fair deal, okay? It's a, sort of, now when you think about Mentioned we've already destroyed about 70, or transformed, not destroyed all, 70 through 7%, means we have to restore a bunch of it. And I think right now what I'm seeing is there's a very interesting discussion happening right now. I'm actually leaving after this to go to a meeting uh, during the UN General Assembly about a global goal for nature that may include, among others, a proposal to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. That means we have to protect the bulk of what we have left right now, including the forest, and I think the good news is there's 102 countries that have already signed up to this. And I think there's a real chance that at the big global biodiversity meeting that we have coming up later this year, that the world will set a global goal to protect 30% of the planet. The other thing we have to do is restore some of the areas that we've lost. 
And I think there's a real chance that if we come together, we have the commitments and the ability, we could actually do it by 2050. And wouldn't that be the kind of planet and the kind of place that we really want to leave for our children, grandchildren, and for nature? Which is think about really setting aside that half of the planet in a way that it can thrive, that we don't lose the species, that we'll have these places, that will sustain the lives of those local communities. And it's also something really important for life itself, because I always sort of the, the part of me always thinks that we always have, we share this planet with about 10 million other species. And let us, there's an ethical commitment that we need to make to this as well, uh, as well as uh, our own well being. Now I'm realizing time, I actually think we have a little bit of time, Jennifer, and I know, I don't know where it's equipped for this. But I'd much rather, if we can, open it up and maybe have a little bit of a dialogue. And there's not a mic, and we can go on, but I think we see this. Uh, and I, there are some mics. So let me open up and ask some of you to uh, join. We've got a remarkable set of people here. So if you'd like to just ask a question, uh, please. I see a lady with a white blouse, I think. Yes, here. Yes, maybe stand up. And, do we have a mic? Yep, uh, we got a mic right thank here. Thank you. Oh, she's good. All right, go, go ahead. When there is so much that we need to do, how do you prioritize where to start and which forests you need to protect from deforestation first if you're limited in capacity? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We do have an online audience and we're streaming, so it's important to capture this. Who would like to take that? Well, Safina. I can, I can start. Um, uh, because it's an important question. We we just did an analysis last year, uh, was released the, the, the Forestation Fronts report uh, that WF did, and we identified 24 deforestation fronts um, uh, where, where it's urgent to take action, where we are like losing forests by the minute, and, and only in the tropics, as we were discussing, we are uh, uh, losing one soccer field every two seconds, or if you like to think about it on an annual basis in the tropics, we lose a forest area the size of Virginia. Um, so those are the places that I will prioritize. Nine of the 24 deforestation fronts are in Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, it's just like terrible. Um, but there's other uh, places. So I will say we need to focus where deforestation threats are more imminent to really make the, the difference because protect, forest protection, protecting the forest, is 100 times more um, impactful than trying to restore the forest. It's also more cost efficient. So that would be my response. We have okay. a question up here. Anyone else want to add to that? No? OK. Yes, please. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, in the back, yes, oh, yeah, sorry. these well, lights are bright, please go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this amazing panel. It's been wonderful to hear you all. Um, so I was curious when you mentioned about this conservation plan to like uh, conserve 30% of the planet. So why, what do you mean by conservation though? So is, is that like the American concept of like taking people out of the forest or, you know, it, it is more holistic integrating, you know, because, you know, indigenous communities will be displaced. And actually, I was at Cartagena, the ATVC, and I, I attended this very interesting talk about uh, following these, like, let's protect, let's untouch half of the planet. And the economic, you know, impact in terms of like buying all that land was, you know, astronomic. So just like pointing it out there. No, that's, thank you for that question. I'm gonna take it on to initially since this is what I do for a living. Um, <laughs> but let me just say the following, no, con conserving for me, it's not, uh, there, there is a place and there is a role for national parks and some of these areas that are sort of strict protection, but there is no doubt that conserving, including areas that are concerned with different uses, and especially including uh, local communities. Uh, I think we've seen uh, that, that we have a lot of good examples where indigenous communities can re be remarkable stewards of some of these areas because they've lived there for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, right after this, I'm going to a meeting that we have with a group called the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities, GATC, which is interesting that it's a global alliance of the indigenous peoples that live in the tropical forests around the world. 
And the statistic that they have and the proposal that we're discussing right now is uh, that we are supporting, I'll come back to it in a second, is they have customary rights to more than 1 billion hectares of forest worldwide. And they really want to hold on to these forests. The issue with many of these areas is they don't have the tenure rights over these areas. So a big part of the support that several groups are looking at is how to support these indigenous communities to secure the rights to these territories so that they can actually protect them. And among other things, avoids their being turned over. So in my role, as Jennifer mentioned, I've been advising, I'm actually joining the Bezos Earth Fund full-time. One of the key initiatives that we're supporting is strengthening the role of indigenous communities as stewards of the land and protectors of the forest. And I think that's, a, that's definitely a huge part. We will never get to 30% or 50% if we don't do it with the local communities. But anyone want to add anything on this? No? No, you're there? Okay. All right. I guess yes. can I just add one thing? Oh, the, just yeah. say, I, I see the, um, I mean, there's no question that, that the vast majority of intact forests is, is in indigenous areas. But I think what, what we need to think about is what, what do they need to be able to hold on to it and make a living? You know, I don't mean cash, but I just like to live in the in these areas. And so I think I see there's a very strong role, uh, not only for people advocacy within the in the regional governments or national governments, but also, you know, if tooting our own horn again. But I think there's a big there's a big role for science, science and the traditional knowledge. I think one of the exactly. things we know is there's. Yep. A, there's a wealth of knowledge there, and there's more of this data that we need to look at. All right, let's carry on. I think we have a few more minutes. Yep. Uh, Down okay. in the front, and then we have one back here. Thank, okay. thank you. Actually, you, you, you partly answered my question, because my question was going to be, how important is it to strengthen tenure rights of IPLC groups? Um, I'm co-director of a global initiative that measures tenure security around the world, and we're also starting to look at that. Um, and I think um, Doug's point is really important about what is actually needed and whose tenure security actually within that, that very large um, heterogeneous group. Um, it would be really interesting to understand what your ideas are about how to, how to target so that you can have the, the biggest impact and, and most swiftly. Thank you. Okay, anyone want to add anything here? I mean, just, just briefly to add that uh, I feel like we need to bring indigenous peoples and local communities to the table to articulate the solutions. And that has not been the case. It's been like, oh, yeah, there's like, uh, we are going to benefit and they are going to, yeah, you know, like we are going to share the benefits and they are going to be beneficiaries of certain projects. They are not invited to the table to design the solution. And I think that has been a problem because it's if you don't really engage them from the design and you, you pretend that you know more what the solution, the right solution are for them, I mean, it's, uh, we're never going to be effective. And there are many reasons why that's hard, but I feel like, again, we just need to embrace complexity because if we don't bring them to the table to listen, what, I mean, at the end of the day, they have been the first line of defense against deforestation for years and decades and, and you know, we, we should listen more and invite them, not as like an afterthought or as a beneficiary at the end of the process, but at the beginning as co-designers of the action. And one of the things you mentioned, the Glasgow conference uh, last year, which was, I was there. One of my favorite moments was to see the stage, and we had about 130 world leaders there, and there was a big commitment there. But at one point, there was President Biden there, Prime Minister Johnson at that point, and the head of the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities as basically a head of state speaking. That is something we need more of. We need their voice on the stage and not just an afterthought. And I think that's something important. That's we have another, yeah, more. we have another question here. Yes, thank you. I can't see much with these slides, so thank you. Uh, sorry, just listen, I'll yeah. use my teacher voice if I can. Um, so I'm a uh, New York City metro area educator. I've been taking classes here at the Botanical Garden. Thank you for all of your work there. Um, and I have been using what I have learned here with students that I work with and with the public. Um, but one of the things that I've learned is the changes that have taken place in the local forests here, things that I've seen just over my lifetime. Driving up the Taconic, I all of a sudden could notice how many ash trees have been killed, for example. Um, I know that there are efforts to restore the American chestnut, and I know that there is something slowly creeping its way through hemlock trees and so forth. So my question is this, and I know that um, Ellie might be able to 
speak on this specifically, but when you talk about restoring land, are we talking about restoring what essentially is a novel ecosystem where it's something where it's a combination of introduced species and invasive species and native species? How much are we trying to sort of wind the clock back to what things were back, what, what things were like, you know, 600 years ago? And how much is being studied about how much we can do where restoration will be successful to restore what was in the past and how much is being researched about what will work to make a viable ecosystem given the mixtures of species that are there now? <clears throat> That's an awesome question. Thank you. Um, and, and like, you're, you're right. I mean, we've had a suite of invasive species that have come through and drastically changed our forests throughout the region, not just in our cities. Um, uh, including hemlock, woolly adelgid, which is something that significantly changed the composition of our forest here. And I think it's, it, I mean, you ask a great, a, a great question. Um, in regards to invasive species, there's a, a multitude of work out there that shows the negative impacts of invasive species on our ecosystems, um, including their resiliency over time, and uh, specifically when we're looking at uh, wildlife associations with our forests. Uh, and so, one of the, the biggest things that we do is to look at first, what is naturally occurring? Like how are these systems responding, right? So are there species that are already here um, that are able to kind of take the place of ones that might be lost? Um, and then also plan out what we might need to in terms of restoration, right? But the question then becomes, are you planting out what was there prior or are you thinking towards the future? And I think there's kind of an in-between, right? So. For instance, um, we do know that our, the ranges of certain species will be changing over time. We're expected to see more southern species as the climate changes. Um, so we can look at species that are maybe already occurring in this area, um, but that have a, a more southern range and start thinking about, well, maybe that's something we include in the restoration project, as opposed to something that was already at the edge of its range and more stressed. So it's, it's a very complex question, I think, and something that we're all trying to answer. I don't think anyone really has a full answer for you. Um, but in regards to, uh, one thing, I, uh, last thing I'll mention is that it's important that we, the best we can, try to maintain uh, a diversity of species in these forests so that um, in the face of an unforeseen future invasive species, right, something else that might come down the line, that we do have a healthy system that can um, rebound from that, that, that potential impact. And I think it's something we've learned over the last hundred years is that uh, we don't know what the next invasive species will be, but there will be another one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hopefully that helps a little bit. I, Happy to so. talk about it later. No, this is a very interesting question, and I, I hope we can continue. Thank you for that question. I'm just conscious of time where I see there are several hands, but I think we'll stick around for conversation issues. But I want to do one final round with you, just a 30-second comment about what can all of us do to protect and restore forests going forward. What's your advice? Who would like to start? Well, Safina. Sure, I mean, I, I can start. I, I think um, we heard it in the morning from Catherine. Um, we are all consumers, so we should use our voice as, 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 and our votes as, as, as consumers, be mindful of what we are consuming, um, looking for the FSC logo, the Forest Stewardship Council, to make sure that your uh, products like tissue and toilet paper and even the packaging of some of the products you buy, that they are uh, coming from responsibly managed forests. So as consumers, we have a responsibility to look at um, products that have uh, palm oil that we don't know if it's, it has caused deforestation. So that's one. Uh, the other one is raise your voice uh, as, uh, as citizens. Um, we all have a civic duty to raise our voices to put forest and nature high up in the business and the political agenda. And we should be supporting any legislative efforts. If you are living here in the US, uh, you can support the Forest Act or you can uh, support the Zero Waste Act, as, as we know also uh, food uh, is one of the key drivers of deforestation because we need more land to produce the food that we need and the, that our animals need to, to, to eat. Um, so if we reduce uh, food waste, we might be able to save some land and, and forest. So engage, uh, raise your voices. Uh, overall, I will say, go out to the forest, enjoy the forest, be there. We've seen, uh, 
flocks of people going to the forest uh, uh, during this pandemic. And that for me is like, what a better place to mend our relationship with nature than in forest itself. So the more you enjoy forest and your kids enjoy forest and, and your family and your friends, the more uh, connection between the head, the heart and the hand will happen. So then and then action uh, will be triggered. That's a great list. Elliot. Yeah, uh, just to reiterate a few things, I, I would say the same thing. Uh, go out and enjoy the forested areas, especially those that are closest to you. I think that's something that we often overlook. Uh, and, and by being out there, I feel like you know you will be inspired to continue that work. And I think that's something I encourage everyone to do. All of these natural areas, especially in our cities and suburban areas, um, are important. And there are likely a, a group or association, as I said before, associated some friends group group of neighborhood volunteers that are working to try to protect that space. And so there's definitely something that you can provide to help that organization um, with the work that they do. So that's, I think, kind of the first step that we, we all could take. Thank you. Lucia. Thank you. Yeah, I'm listening to them. And I'm also reflecting here and reflecting about this morning's talk. And I loved when Catherine asked that question at the end, which was like, um, so how do you feel about climate change after the talk? And I saw these wonderful words that were like motivated, determined, empowered, and hopeful. And it was wonderful to see that. But there was one word that I, was, I wished I had seen, and I hope we all can have that even more strongly, which is commitment. So we really need to commit to this and do everything we can. And we also need to look for our superpowers so all of us have our superpowers. And is it drawing? Is it talking? Is it poem? Is it anything? And just get that one superpower and use that as our voice to really communicate and to do everything we can to prevent deforestation and climate change. I would say one, one thing that's really important for every, every individual to do is to appreciate that forests are not just a bunch of trees. It is, they are complex systems. Uh, we need to not only appreciate them, we need to protect them. Uh, there's there's no, no question that, that if you protect a forest, you're doing your part for climate change. There's, uh, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, in terms of individual efforts, you're not, not all of us can be a great Greta Thunberg, you know. <laughs> I think there's only one of her. Uh, but I think that uh, I'd like to pick up on what Lucy said about you know, your superpower. There are people who make heroic efforts, and you can make your own, you can participate in others. I think one of the most important things, it's ironically, one of the most important things, and perhaps the most important thing you can do uh, as, as an individual is to make networks. So in other words, you know, the, the one thing you want to avoid is, is to, to try and just operate on your own. It's, it, the, there's the synergy of one plus one equals 3,000 is, uh, is really operative here. And I think that there's, um, I think there's that therapy that everybody gets for going into a forest. So it's, it's, it, well, if we could only take all these, uh, the, the, the developmentalists, as we call them in Brazil, we could just take them on a really hot day and, and have walk from a, a lawn into a forest and feel the, the change of 20 degrees in, in, in temperature, uh, then you can, you can really convert a lot. But, but it's, um, there's, like I said, everybody has it. It's something that they can do. I, I see volunteering is, is fantastic. I mean, I have unbelievable people volunteering with me and, and I, who are carrying projects along that I could never do, certainly not on my own. And so that's, that's part of the networking also. Thank you. I mean, those are great comments. So let me just finish with three, three things to ask you. One is make a different choice, whatever you do, and some of the things we heard this morning. If every one of us changes a little bit of what we do, what we eat, the way we get around or others, I think that starts changing it. Second is go to a forest and take a friend to a forest. And you can start right here at the Tame Family Forest is I think that's a way to really connect with forests and reconnect with that nature, which is really important. And the last I'll mention is, please, as you are today, continue to support the New York Botanical Garden. So I think this is a truly remarkable organization that does the science that we need to document these places and these forests around the world. It allows us to use that information to inform the decisions that we make both here in New York around the world 
and it helps inspire millions of people that come here every day. And I think that's a tremendous issue. And I want to say thank you for uh, to the garden for the opportunity to be here for establishing this uh, lecture. And I know that Tom and Ed would have been very proud and I just wish they were here, but we'll continue on with their legacy. Thank you all very much. Please join me and thank your panelists. so much to this panel. It was truly inspiring. I will say I think Forrest definitely had a moment here today. So thank you all and thank you all for coming. Come back next year. Take care.